Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm proud to welcome you to our camp campus for this, the first event in our 2014 President's Speaker Series. Since Cal State Monterey Bay was founded, our campus has maintained a strong commitment to social justice. And one important aspect of that is economic empowerment for our community. As a university, we must reach into all parts of our community to provide access to an education that will allow people to build better lives. Our enrollments are increasing. So too are the sizes of our graduating classes and the number and prominence of our alumni. Those are all signs of progress. However, we realize that simply awarding more degrees is not enough. Our graduates need family wage jobs and our community needs them to find those jobs in our area. We cannot afford to have our best and brightest students leave the Central Coast for better opportunities elsewhere. And Cal State Monterey Bay has an important role to play in building an innovation economy that will create local jobs. So when we decided uh, that the theme for this year, uh, this year's presidential speaker series would be Flourish Monterey County, we knew that a critical part of our discussions would concern economic development. I'm sure that some of you who are here today also attended our December colloquium on economic development of the former Ford Ord. For that event, we were able to bring a number of outstanding nationally recognized speakers to share their insights and perspectives on how we should move forward. We're pleased to welcome one of the best of those speakers back to our campus today. I hope we can continue the discussion about the economic future of our county and the role that our university can play in making it stronger. Mary Jo Waits is the Director of the Economic, Human Services, and Workforce Division at the National Governors Association. Her division focuses on developing innovative policy options that encourage sustainable economic development. And another area of emphasis for the division is employment and social services for youth and low-income families. Before joining the National Governors Association, Mary Jo was Project Director with the Pew Center on the States. She has also held numerous positions in her native Arizona as a principal of her own public policy consulting firm, an associate director of the Morrison Institute for Public Policy at Arizona State University, and as assistant director of the governor of Arizona's Office of Policy Development and Planning. Mary Jo is also the author of a number of publications that focus on economic development, incentives, and recovery. Through her work with state and local government, Mary Jo has developed an in-depth understanding of what makes local economies successful. I'm happy we have been able to bring her back to campus to share more of her ideas with us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Waits. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be back. Um, if, if you know my story, um, I have uh, had some uh, rather trying uh, times of getting here to, to be with you. Uh, the first time I came for the uh, forum uh, to, on how to pr repurpose, reuse uh, uh, Fort Ord, I was uh, on my way to the um, uh, hotel. I was stopped by the, the uh, policeman because I had stopped for directions and I didn't turn my lights back on. And then I was also caught with uh, talking on my cell phone. So I, I didn't realize all the rules here. Uh, they, it was a very nice interaction, however. I had a very nice conversation about the, what should I tell you all, the business leaders, about what to do about the reuse of Fort Ord. So I conveyed that in my messages. This time, I was caught in the snowstorm in Washington, D.C. Uh, turns out I was one of only two planes that got out all day uh, uh, yesterday from the snowstorm. So I'm happy to be here. And you can tell it took a lot of determination on my part, uh, certainly this time, to be here. And I really wanted to, to return so, uh, and share uh, some of my knowledge and experience uh, about how do you leverage your universities in uh, regional economic development. <clears throat> My presentation, I'm going to do it in three parts. One, I would like to set the first, I would like to set the context, sort of understanding uh, what the challenges are um, uh, for universities and for communities and states, uh, and, and what we have to do to think about as the backdrop, the big picture, when we're thinking about 
uh, what we ask our universities to do or how we work with our universities. Then the second part, <clears throat> I'll talk about some of the frameworks. How do we decide uh, the, the right uh, framework to, that all of us can use, both the business community, the university, uh, policymakers on helping uh, leverage the strengths at the universities, but also build the strengths of the universities so that they help your community uh, prosper and, and grow and compete in a global economy. And then the third part of my presentation, uh, which I think is probably the more fun, so I will speed through the rest of it and try to get to those, is really to bring you some examples that show some of the, the, the um, the, uh, how things have been put into practice elsewhere and who might also give you some ideas. Not all of them will be totally matching up with your community or with your university, but I think what my experience is you take from the best and you bring them home and you use them for how they work for you. You meld those ideas into how they work for you, for your community and for your university. So let me start with the, the key public policy themes. As was mentioned, I work for the National Governors Association. It's, the, it's an association of all the nation's governors. Uh, Governor Brown is, is part of our, our uh, NGA and very active. But what I've seen over the last um, uh, five years or so in terms of what's changed in the public policy uh, debate and perspective of governors, and I say state, but I'm telling you that cities, and I think counties, those of you who are leaders from the city, uh, the cities and the counties here will, will also, uh, these ideas, these themes will resonate with you and what you've been thinking about. First and foremost is that uh, everybody's been concerned about the, bu the budget revenue. Where do we get the dollars? When are we going to come back to the, the state that we were before 2007? And then now we're starting to see surpluses emerge. And what do we do with those surpluses? How do we invest those surpluses? So it's a really great time to be having these kinds of conversations. The other big issue is, of course, uh, the Medicaid and health care costs, government redesign and performance. And I'm going to go through these very uh, quickly so that you get a flavor of what's, 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 what we're all balancing when we're thinking about our, our investment policy choices and investment decisions. So on the budget uh, issue, it's really about not only not worrying about where you're going to get your revenue and how you invest, but it's really also, it's particularly related to universities, is the, the issue of health care. Governors uh, are very concerned, and as are po all policymakers and business leaders, very concerned about the fact that with uh, health care eating up so much of the bu budget, we have very little revenue to invest in education, both in terms of the research as well as uh, the talent that we need. And so that's a very important um, consideration. Uh, on, govern on government design and performance, uh, I've been in public policy area for a long time, both at the, the local level and the state level, and I can tell you that this is the era of redesign uh, and performance, holding government accountable uh, for, for outcomes and seeing results. And this is an example, no offense to the academic community, but uh, Secretary Duncan is cl uh, famous for having made this quote about the biggest challenges facing our higher education today is high prices, low completion rates, and too little accountability. Uh, so I think the, the, the bright spotlight has turned on a lot of organizations, a lot of agencies, both at the state level and the city level, of really thinking about what do we get for our investment. This is just an example of the metrics that the governor's NGA has recommended to uh, uh, universities and, and um, uh, the governors to think about and how you start measuring success. Uh, and the president mentioned many of these in, in his opening remark. We're going to start looking at degrees awarded, uh, graduation rates. It's not enough just to make sure students get into the universities and community colleges, but start thinking about uh, the completion. And, what, and the jobs that they get as a result of those degrees. 
The other really big issue that we all feel is that um, even though we're seeing an end to the recession, we're not getting back as many jobs as we had and that we lost during the recession. This is a new Kaufman graph showing this is for technology firms, but as we know, technology for firms lead a lot of the job creation and creation. And you can see that we're, the, we're just not catching up. Uh, from the creation part of jobs is not uh, above the job the destruction. So it's really this issue, a very big challenge of thinking about what's going on with, uh, has the economy turned soft on risk and entrepreneurship? Um, the companies just adding jobs more slowly. Uh, and that's certainly a concern for almost every policymaker and certainly uh, many of the business communities as well. Then we think a lot about the issues of, of uh, unemployed Americans, and this is my favorite quote. While all of us were worried about the pensions at the local level and our retirees at the, at the state level, uh, it was sort of uh, Paul Krugman who really said, we ought to start thinking about the unemployed Americans, uh, not the folks who have retirements and pensions, but what do we do about the unemployed uh, Americans? And importantly, in, in, the, in the national uh, um, Capitol in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, for the first time ever I've seen more articles written about what's the, what's the issue about social mobility? What are we going to do about uh, social mobility? And more and more people are having that conversation, which I think is, is all very positive. Well, the real issue is, because of all of these issues, what I see in states and local communities all across the country is it's really become a, a call for an all-hands-on-deck. People are really worried about the economy, uh, and it's really thinking about it's just not about the Economic Development Agency anymore. It's in the state level. It's not just about the Department of Commerce. But it's about uh, the universities thinking about economic development. It's about the energy office thinking about economic development. How is uh, uh, clean energy going to be part of the economic development solution? It's about health care, thinking about a part of being part of the economic development equation, not only in terms of jobs and the training the ta talent that's needed, but thinking about reducing the health care costs. So just this notion of everybody's got to be on board when we're thinking about uh, what are we going to do about regional economic growth. And what I find very interesting, and when you look at this list here, one of the things that uh, governors are starting to recognize, and I think local communities are recognizing, is that if you look at all those bullet points, one of the most important things you find out is uh, the, the universities play a role in almost every one of those uh, bullet points. And in the past, governors and many mayors might have thought it was all about the economic development of the Commerce Agency, but really starting to recognize that what matters in terms of talent uh, and even revitalization of communities, that really is not something that traditionally f uh, falls within our, our thinking about what's the responsibility of economic development organizations. So it is a uh, time of all hands on deck or all in, as some have said. And then we turn to 2014. And I can tell you now, all of those of us who look through the state of the state messages around the, the country by all the governors, here's the theme. It is definitely a really laser focus on education, workforce, and economic development. The notion that we've got to have better alignment between what is going on in our economies, what is the education pipeline to match that economy and also the workforce. Uh, and what does it take to do that? Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides. This is a brochure of the, uh, the National Governor's Initiative um, that's going on in this area. But you can see why we're worried about this. Why is the issue uh, that's front and center um, right now? And this is a slide from Harvard University, Harvard Business School, Michael Porter and many others at Harvard Business School, including all the major CEOs, have taken on the issue of Americans, America's competitiveness. 
made it a major effort of all of Harvard, just as MIT has taken on the issue of advanced manufacturing, thinking about really strategically what's it going to take to help America compete, both in terms of research, but particularly in terms of talent, and particularly in terms of how do we help small and medium-sized businesses uh, uh, survive and thrive in a global economy. But I love this chart where you're really looking at uh, what's, what, where are the strengths that, that are disappearing and you can see the skilled labor as one of the really key issues that everybody's focused on. Another disturbing trend is really, uh, this is very well put, I think, uh, back to the notion of we have 7% of the folks unemployed, but companies consistently report that they cannot find employees they need to fill, fill jobs. Yet, as McKinsey and others have pointed out in surveys, a third of employers never communicate with education institutions about their needs. And third, and, and the third bullet, a third of education institutions can't estimate their job placement rates. Those that can often overestimate it. So it sort of puts on the table some of the, the trends and some of the reasons why we're focused on more and more of what are the contributions of uh, universities uh, to our economies. Four more considerations just to put out there as the background. Uh, we're finding as states and local communities and universities, we're dealing with more and more players. In the, in the you know, last decade, maybe we, we worried about what the state was doing next door, what the university was doing down the street, what the city was doing in the next region. Uh, but now we're really thinking about, as you well know, China, India, Singapore, Eastern Europe, uh, really just much more, have to know much more about what's going on all, all across the world. The other thing is the changing fiscal dynamics. While we're all thinking about how do we get out of this economy, how do we start to invest uh, in the things that really matter, you look at what's being ha what's, what the investment's being made around the country and it makes all of us nervous. My favorite one is a new research university with a day, with a day one endowment of $10 billion equal to what it took MIT 142 years to accumulate. Uh, creating entire um, uh, a global nanotechnology hub, including constructing 14 new world-class universities. That, that's enough to make us all wonder uh, what the heck we do to, uh, uh, to compete going forward. A rising demand on professionalism. Uh, multinational corporations uh, have been, have been uh, locating all over the world and they come back telling us that uh, the professional uh, knowledge and understanding of their industry uh, around the world is different than what they're finding in the United States. And so this raises the bar for the economic professional community and the universities and elected officials to understand uh, what the economy is, what industry needs. And then finally, the whole notion that um, we have to start managing an innovation ecosystem, which I'm going to talk a lot more about. But it's really interesting because when you learn what it means by to manage an innovation ecosystem, we find out that it's probably not what any of our agencies do. So certainly not economic development organizations, maybe pieces of a university, uh, maybe some, uh, some associations, but it's really starting to think about what the heck does that mean when I'm managing an uh, um, innovation ecosystem. So those are kind of negative thoughts. So before I turn to the rest of my uh, presentation, I thought I should, should raise the, your spirits a little bit with some positive signs. So let's talk about five positive signs. More diplomas. This, I love this. This is from somebody else. I've cited the source here. We're seeing more diplomas. High school graduation rates have risen. Uh, this says 78% in 2010, but if anybody watched the All-Star Game, which I didn't, but I read about it in the newspaper, Secretary of Education Duncan played, and his jersey was 80. Does anybody know what that was for? It's exactly. The graduation rate was up to 80%. Uh, so that's good news. There's new knowledge with less cost. That's good news. Lower health care inflation. And then powering America with less. So there are some very positive signs on the horizon. And then I'll share a few more. 
and that the National Governors Association just had its winter meeting in um, Washington, D.C. in February, and our keynote speaker was Jeff Immelt, uh, CEO of uh, GE. Uh, and here's what he told the nation's governors. So you're going to see me sprinkle a couple of his, a lot of his comments throughout my presentation because it just really puts a, he was so articulate and he was so good at expressing uh, industry's perspective, what he needs from public, what they need from public policy, what they need from institutions. And so I thought they, I couldn't say them better. So you're going to see a, a little bit of his comments sprinkled out through my presentation. So here is the positive news. Bottom line is we're seeing growth, but it's very slow and it's going to be volatile and slow for a long time. Uh, and if he was warning us that if we locate a facility in your state or your community, it's not to serve your state, it's to serve the lar larger global world. He and other corporations are looking for locations that help him to be competitive globally. And then the good news is for, he's been all over and he finds that the U.S. workers are up to the task uh, for, for producing the goods that are competitive in the global marketplace. The other three things that I found interesting was where is GE investing um, uh, and where are its big, three big themes and I think this helps us think about where are we looking at the future, where are we looking at the opportunities. One is obviously living in an age of natural gas. The whole idea that uh, the games changed with the idea of cheaper, uh, cheaper power but also all the new technologies that come with that and who's taking advantage of, of those opportunities. Advanced manufacturing, I think you all know, you read the headlines, we're all, everybody's worrying about, thinking about the opportunities in advanced manufacturing and how it benefits um, the U.S. and our communities. Uh, and GE made a very powerful statement about the five kinds of investments he will be making in the U.S. And um, they will be, we'll talk about some of those as we go along because they're very relevant to the kinds of things that I think all communities should stay focused on and certainly with their relationships to their universities. And then finally, the whole idea of the growth of the industrial internet. Uh, basically that um, the application of sensors and, and um, uh, data analytics and communications will be, uh, will be an important part of the manufacturing process, production process, and, and his prediction is that it will be as important in terms of what the amount of people it involves in innovation as the social internet has been in the past. So I think those are all very positive statements and I think that's, that's as, at least something to look forward to. But I also would like to bring back to the point where um, I, I think what we're seeing over and over again from governors and from the business leadership that universities are, are, have always been important, but they're going to be more important than ever before. Uh, and, and those communities that have universities uh, are certainly ahead of the game. Those communities who don't uh, need to figure out how to connect to uh, universities elsewhere and I will give you examples on how to do that. And frankly, I would say this and, and I hope the President's not offended, but my view is all communities, you connect to as many universities as you can but in an organized way and hopefully through the window of the university that, that you have here. And I'll talk about some of those examples. So the message to me is, or to you, and to me, and everybody should be, what I'm finding is policymakers are doubling down on policy uh, and the expectations for universities. And I characterize this policy in two ways. There's been the Policy Agenda 101, which was largely about, for the past years, thinking about getting more Americans into and successfully out of college. So for a long time, it was the, the discussion was a lot about access, a very important discussion, and it's still very important, as we know, because of the issues about financial aid and other issues. But it's also turned towards uh, getting um, students successfully out of college. So that's one track 
The other track is, um, and many universities uh, don't like this track, frankly, and that's sort of doubling down on the policy and the expectations that the universities will be active and help create new good paying jobs in the economy and making workers uh, ready for those jobs. So now we're talking about not just an education role, uh, but also a workforce development role. And traditionally, that's not been something that uh, many universities have, have seen as, as uh, maybe something they were uh, engaged in. But the important thing is to show how it's evolved. So, and the president mentioned this as we started out, so I thought we're right on sync here. I think the question is no longer how many degrees you're, you're, uh, you're producing, but degrees for what jobs. The discussion has changed about, and the accountability's changed towards what jobs, degrees for what jobs. And it's, it's been really evident to me when I go out and have a discussion in communities. We actually have had a project working with uh, universities and, and uh, communities and governors to think about setting state goals. Uh, the goals the way the president has set the, the goals in terms of we want to see X percent of our population with a bachelor's degree or, or a, uh, an associate's degree plus a bachelor's degree. But I, when I go out and I have, I'm part of those discussions and when they brought the academic institutions and the, the business community together, it, without fail, the business community says, no, don't set a state goal of how many more degrees. Tell me how many goals, how many degrees you're going to have in healthcare, in IT, in my industry. It's not about the generic degrees. It's about the, the, the generic number of degrees or percentage, but start to drill down even more and talk about how degrees for what jobs and what positions. And, go, and uh, Jeff Immelt really put the nail on the head. Here's, I've summarized uh, all of sort of his statements to GE looks to, for in a state. I, I use state because that's what he's talking about, but he was talking about communities. So please read into state, region, local. Um, you can see the other things. I'm going to focus on the blue bullets, um, but the, I think all of them are very important to how you think about uh, working with industry. But my favorite one was the talented workforce. It's a good thing when a governor or a mayor can describe how many welders and engineers they prepare every year. He made it really clear that one of the reasons he's put facilities in Vietnam is that he, one of the first conversations he had was basically they could tell, tell me how many welders and engineers they could promise that they would have. And it's been an incredible partnership. Uh, and so that's kind of the standards in terms of where he's looking forward. But I thought that was a very good statement about tell me how many welders and how many engineers you're going to prepare. Other industries will want the same kind of uh, message. Showing you how the conversation has evolved uh, is this slide again from the Harvard Business School. So uh, how many people ever thought that the Harvard Business School would be working with the business community to, to really parse exactly degrees for what jobs? What, what careers are going to have the most lifetime value, you can see on the bottom axis, and what are going to be the most valuable to the business. And as you know from the quadrants, uh, the green one is the most sought after quadrant in terms of high value to business and high value to the individual. This is getting very, um, everybody's raising the bar in the game in terms of how you start thinking about the talent and uh, how we interact with uh, the universities and the community colleges to communicate the talent that's going to be important to business. And then how do we communicate with our students and our children to think about where, where is the degree that's going to give you the, the most uh, career lifetime value. Here's another one that I like. I pulled out just because it shows the career pathway. Really par uh, charting out uh, and again, let me tell you that the business community, uh, the CEOs have commissioned uh, the Harvard Business School to start looking at these kinds of uh, an analysis and also surveying uh, the business community to talk about how they're engaged 
with the universities and the community colleges and communicating their needs and interacting and solving the needs, which we'll talk a little bit. So the other doubling down on the policy is uh, creating jobs. So in the past, we worried about our universities having a better tech transfer office um, um, and worrying about how we get those last, uh, licenses, uh, academic licenses out the door and with uh, and commercialized and created a new business. And I'm not, I'm, I'm talking too long on this part, so I'm not going to go into the details, but the point I want to make is doubling down on the policy in this area and the expectations of the universities. It started, uh, the conversation was about, well, how many jobs are you creating? How many entrepreneurs are you helping us uh, nurture? to really moving much more to a conversation about recognizing that how do you help us create an innovation hub? Uh, and this is a, a picture of Bo uh, MIT, Boston. Certainly a very uh, stellar, not everybody's uh, going to be able to be that particular innovation hub, but what we've learned from studying these kinds of innovation hubs is that there is something important about locations that really allows for, um, that foster co-location of um, anchor institutions like meds and eds as we call them with the businesses and then the surrounding community around them that allows for the easy interactions, the networks, everything that's out there. And right smack in the middle of many of these innovation hubs are universities uh, and academic institutions. And it's really starting to think about, okay, how does the university help me do that? Um, we want them to still uh, commercialize their research, but really what is it and what is the strategy that helps uh, us as a community create these kinds of innovation hubs that both attract new companies but also more importantly uh, grow our own entrepreneurs. So th what will be key when we're looking at this, we're looking at innovation hubs through an ecosystem, a habitat lens and assembling a multidisciplinary leadership team that partners to ensure to partners with the community to ensure that the region is being ambitious enough and comprehensive enough. If we haven't gone around and visited all the innovation hubs, it's really hard to know if we're ambitious enough. And it's really important to bring that kind of perspective to your community because a lot of places are very much focused on this. And it starts with reimagining the spaces around your universities and your me medical research institutions as places that can be shaped physically and strategically uh, to anchor an innovation ecosystem. In earlier conversations, I, I was, it was pointed out that you have something like 30 uh, or so uh, research institutions or anchor institutions in addition to the university to be thinking about that. And then how do you get all those critical ingredients together? That's about smart people, research institution, entrepreneurial training, and mentors, professional networks, all, as well as the placemaking uh, attributes that, uh, that allow for interaction, but also quality of life and, and, and ensures that people want to be here. Um, so those are actually what we mean in terms of doubling down on the expectations of universities, what, what communities are starting to have of the universities, uh, and what uh, universities ought to start thinking about how do they contribute to uh, the local economy. So let me tell you a little bit about how do you think about all this. That's a lot of factors. I've been through a lot of things thinking about, well, what are all those factors that go in an ecosystem? What are all the factors that we think about? And frankly, we have to have all this, we need to have all have the same framework or at least a fairly similar framework because we can't invest together. We can't uh, co-lead together. We can't coordinate to move the business community, the economic development organizations, and the uh, universities all together if we don't have some kind of strategic framework to think about those policy decisions and the investments to be made. So I'm going to think about, I'm going to put out two that I think are valuable and then I will move to some examples. I think anybody in my shoes, 
<laughs> uh, would tell you that you have to focus on what drives growth. Um, this is the classic statement in terms of thinking about productivity, as Michael Porter told the governors in 2011. You can focus on whatever you want, but productivity determines wages, productivity sets jobs, productivity determines the standard of living. The productivity of your industries and your workers are what's really, uh, for in those companies, are really what's going to help drive your economy. And um, it's, I don't know an organization yet that says that's their mission statement. However, I did find one in Alaska recently called the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute that was created in 1981 uh, to help the Alaska, the seafood industry, not only manage its resources, but to um, uh, add value. And so it uh, increases productivity, frankly. It's words where their mission was, is, to increase the volume and the volume, the volume and the value of the seafood industry. And I was just in um, at a session there, and I was telling some of the colleagues here earlier that I heard uh, uh, somebody who spearheads a, a similar kind of effort in Iceland talk at this conference about how you squeeze value out of a cod. And he proceeded to put a diagram of a cod fish up on the screen and show little by little all the waste that in the past had been just thrown out and how when you started getting all the industry together with the universities and with other industry across industries like the pharmaceutical industry, the, the medical industry together, what you could squeeze out of value out of a cod. And you ended up with what they used to think was the most valuable piece of cod was not what was the most valuable piece of cod. What was the most valuable piece of cod was about this much oil that goes something like $240 uh, something uh, for uh, cosmetics. And they never dreamed of this. And now they're thinking about how to use cod to make clothes and material and whatever. But that is a definition of increasing productivity if I've ever seen it. So I love it. Many of the speakers, though, we had nightmares for two days for the rest of the time dreaming about that cod and how you dissect it. So, okay, so if you're focusing on productivity, that's kind of a technical term. Businesses talk about it. I'm not really suggesting that maybe that's the right mission statement, but I think the point is, so I think we all have to be better students of, of knowing where growth comes from. And I've, in, the, in the, right after the recession, we had the chair's initiative was about growing state economies, and my first job was to go through the literature I have a uh, bipartisan group. It's a nonpartisan organization. It's R's and D's. Um, so my first job was to say, let's say what the literature says matters for growth. And let's all start on a common page of understanding what we're focusing on. And so this is from the literature. But what the most important thing is, of course, you got to focus on entrepreneurs. Uh, those, those individuals who seed and grow companies and renew companies, you've got to focus on education skills over and over again. It's been proving that a concentration of skills and educated individuals in a community are one of the most important things for uh, driving growth and certainly productivity. Now Kaufman has a new study that basically is, is pointing out that actually the best indicator of innovation and entrepreneurship are not the patents and things that come out of universities, but the critical mass of highly educated talent. Uh, it's talking about innovation and technology, private capital, Global markets and linkages and industry clusters, understanding that uh, in, uh, firms that are in an industry cluster are stronger in terms of their productivity and their ability to compete. And certainly strong clusters uh, produce uh, um, uh, uh, more job creation, more entrepreneurs, and usually high value or high wage jobs. So thinking about really focusing on those things. Uh, the other most important thing about this, in addition to understanding that, is really thinking about, you know, the role of the university in every one of those areas. 
even in private capital, frankly, not private capital, but more and more the universities are actually saying, we can't just wait around anymore. We, we have access to a lot of very wealthy individuals who sit on our foundations and other places and alumni and really starting to accumulate angel capital and capital to help with even the, 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 um, the capital issue. Um, the other important thing to point out is the global markets. I often tell a governor and other leaders that what do you, who do you think is one of the most globally connected entities in your community or your state? They'll always name the largest company, never fails. And I will say actually it's probably your university. Uh, not only for the students, but probably many of their programs are related to other programs elsewhere. And if a lot of universities now are really competing very strongly to be located around the globe and thinking about that and also training CEOs uh, and other, other kinds of individuals for jobs. So there's so much there in terms of thinking about how does the university contribute in all those areas. The other important thing to think about is uh, we think about clusters not only, and I know you've done your analysis here, and know what your clusters are in many respects, but we've, we've figured out that the most important thing about the cluster analysis is that we really have a service delivery tool. We have a way to build specialized talent pools for that industry, build unique research centers for that industry, have, uh, coordinate strong collaborations and other linkages and resources that benefit a group of companies, not just one company. States have learned to do this. We're not very good on the service delivery part yet, or communities either. We're still working on that. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples, but most importantly here too is states are also learning that joint action to enhance the impact of clusters doesn't happen automatically. Um, it's a lot of effort to coordinate a lot of actors. They must communicate their respective needs to each other, prioritize collectively their actions. They commit resources to solve those needs and work together to streamline the delivery of resources. That doesn't happen automatically. I know we hear the stories about Silicon Valley and a lot of spontaneity. That does happen. There's no question about it. But really, when you're really starting to think about how do we show the critical mass? How do we provide linkages? It really does take uh, some entity uh, to start thinking about how do we coordinate some of these activities and how do we make all the connections that are going to be important. So my next part, the framework I really suggest that you think about and I advise most folks to think about in terms of where they make their policy decisions, both at a university, but a state and a local level, as because I learned it from the business community. So everybody wants to know how to create an innovation hub, how to be, how to have more innovation, new ideas. So my source was I studied the Harvard Business Review because every every policy leader kept asking me, well, so what do I do, Mary Jo? What do I do? I don't I don't get this. What do I do? Isn't this natural? What do you, what happens? So I started reading Harvard Business Review and I can tell you that there's story after story about CEOs thinking about what does it mean to be um, uh, to create an innovative environment. <clears throat> and there are four things that is pretty much uh, thought about these days. Uh, number one is you got to have expertise. You got to have smart people. You got to have smart people with ideas, uh, for sure. You, you've got to have. Then you got to have uh, interaction. As we say, um, uh, um, you have to figure out how to get those ideas out and uh, out the door. And so you got to have interaction. And we learned that most of the innovation that occurs is a people-to-people kind of interaction still. So how do you think about creating that interaction, the collaboration, the networks? Uh, the third thing, it's not just about interaction though, it's interaction among a diverse set of actors and players. So the classic example, if you're talking to people who look just like you, the same age as you, same background, same discipline, same industry, you're probably not going to see sparks fly. So the whole idea of how do we get, how do we start to have uh, interact with others so that we get new ideas and other experts. And then finally, we know ideas are no good if they just sit there. So it's about the application. How do you use that idea? How do you apply it? And better yet, how do you create 
uh, a business with it. So innovation's in the center. That's the sweet spot. I was just told when I was in Alaska that did you know those, those four circles spell idea? So what do I know? <laughs> so when you put that together, that spells idea. Uh, so I thought that was pretty clever. Uh, so let me tell you very quickly, uh, and then I'm going to get to examples, uh, and I'm a little bit over my time here. So let me tell you very quickly some examples. So how do you think about both as a community and as a university about these four circles? What kind of things, and I'm going to go through very fast, and there's a lot of examples in here, but your, uh, the slides will be available. So what does it mean to build expertise? What do we think about? Oops, sorry. Uh, build expertise. Best way to build ex one of the best ways to build expertise is you have unique institutions that attract and support the, the, the people with the talent and the foresight to create new ideas. You got one here. You got 30 others, I've been told. Uh, very impressive. So how do you think about those unique institutions? And by the way, even though my examples look like they're in the, the engineering science area, there is a clean energy one there. Uh, but it's also art institutions. Uh, uh, it's n don't limit it to uh, these, the, the normal science and technology institutes. What do you have that's unique? Uh, that signals you've got an expertise. Certainly the research strengths, um, thinking about your research strengths, um, and, and um, that's part of your statement about your expertise. More and more, a lot of places are putting research uh, dollars into research talent, really trying to figure out who, not a, to the faculty and the researchers that are going to be very important to drive the conversation and signal that you have expertise in particular areas. There's research now that says that investment in uh, this kind of talent really pays off. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Enrico Moretti at the University of California at Berkeley has a very nice study showing that while we worry about talent being footloose, the payoffs of spending uh, dollars on top-notch talent at your universities and your research institutions certainly pays off. Building expertise, we've already talked about a lot of these. Building your workers, workers and your skills. Um, new fields and young talent, focusing on new fields. Uh, more and more, when you have enter a conversation with an industry, a, a company or a, an industry, uh, a largely a cluster, you're finding out that the degrees you have, the fields you have, the colleges you have don't quite fit with what the world, how they're operating today. So thinking about those those new kinds of programs, and I will tell you, I make this joke that I, I, as you heard, I went to ASU. I'm still on the ASU email, and I get an email every day from ASU from Michael Crow. It's not really the president, but it's their email serve. And it's always, probably once a month, I hear about a new, new field, a new degree that's been created because of interactions with industry. Big, strong push on uh, entrepreneurial immigrants. I love this. Do I don't know if it's going to work, but the, the Detroit and the, the governor of, uh, of um, Michigan thought that this was a good strategy for bringing in talent sounded like a good idea to me. There are all kinds of hurdles there, but it shows you how creative people are being. Facilitating any interaction. So um, I'm going to talk more about these in my examples, so I'm not going to go over them here. But so the whole idea of facilitating interaction collaboration, the notion of building innovation hubs, innovation districts. We've got classic examples from Atlanta's Technology Square, San Diego's Torrey Pines, um, Ohio's building theirs. We've got lots of examples. Uh, the question is you just study them and you execute them and you get the right players around the table. Um, the mega partnerships. Um, I'm going to talk about the institutes of collaboration. Networks are so important, part of creating the networks. Shared facilities, the idea, and I heard today, the idea of putting, you know, the college, uh, the college program and the, uh, the technology folks together. Uh, the idea of shared facilities for researchers and businesses, uh, certainly, uh, uh, certainly starting to take hold all around the country. The idea of, of balancing the small wonders 
uh, that are very important to a community so that you have that authentic places where you can go collaborate where you want to meet and where you want to interact and and um, that's so important to part of this we get caught up in the big big uh, uh, bricks and mortar investments and we forget about the the little spaces that are very important for interaction the idea of putting diverse knowledge fields and cultures together again putting different kinds of researchers different industries in facilities together uh, certainly thinking about uh, how do you get the right brain and the left brain together more and more we're seeing this is one of the new degree programs at ASU where we're putting designers and engineers together so that they get a joint degree in, in certain parts of it uh, the idea of, um, of entrepreneurship across the entire university or college, thinking about that, what, why not be teaching uh, or having uh, art students involved in entrepreneurship? Uh, all, all thinking about that much more strategically. Uh, pushing commercialization. This is, I think I've made this point, but the important thing is, and I know you're doing this here, the whole idea of having your partnerships with industry so that they're, 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 they're talking about what's, what's relevant, what's going to solve their problems, what's going to be valuable in the marketplace, rather than just thinking about what, what, what I as a researcher wants to work on or um, a faculty member. But it, the new models of entrepreneurship training, I think the important message is that we have learned so much uh, been thinking through before this recession but at, during the recession of what really works and picking up an old model is just not something anybody should be doing these days and you in particular and I know you're looking at these the new models for entrepreneurship training this, uh, are really out there and starting to show success and of course they've been pioneered in Stanford and you have um, right access to a lot of that talent in the back <clears throat> in your back door here so I'm going to move quickly to this issue of, so you've got all these elements. You've got to worry about expertise. You've got to worry about uh, talent. You've got to worry about a research expertise. You've got to worry about talent. You've got to worry about interaction. You've got to worry about entrepreneurship. You've got to worry about all these things. And you've got all these players that make this ecosystem work. The real question that's come up now is, who coordinates all this? I don't know, if you had all these players out there or each one's doing their own thing, you're not going to have a, much of an impact compared to what you could have if you were coordinating all of these elements. Uh, a lot of places are starting to come up with the idea of an intermediary. Maybe we need an organization that helps nurture this ecosystem. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. It could be an existing organization. Maybe it's part of the university. Maybe it's something else. There are lots of experiments bubbling up, which I'm going to sh talk to you a little bit about around the country. And, and I have to tell you, here's what I find across, the, we're actually studying these, here's what I find that's, that's happening with some common characteristics. These, they're led by leaders who proactively find and nurture connections across the boundaries. And they know who to connect with whom. It's constantly connecting. Uh, there's speed and flexibility in working with industry both for talent, for research, for anything, really thinking about how do you respond quickly. There's an industry focus that allows innovation to be strategically targeted at sectors that are promising to the state or region. Uh, and then there's spaces that crosses traditional academic boundaries. So what are the kind of spaces you either build on campus at Fort Fort Ord with the reuse or downtown, what are the spaces you build where you cross the traditional academic boundaries so that, that uh, different disciplines, different people get together and interact uh, and then push, uh, push research and entrepreneurs and industries beyond their specializations and think about uh, new discoveries and new boundaries. So those are kind of the experiments we're seeing and let me give you some examples very quickly about what I'm seeing emerge and I think from what I've heard in my earlier conversations uh, they won't totally fit with your industry clusters but they will fit with if you'll see I'll point out the common themes that I see so first and foremost is what we call I call it ONAMI it's the Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnology Institute 
So how did this get started? The state of Oregon decided they wanted to uh, create some, <clears throat> some new emerging clusters, to find some new emerging clusters. The industry, Hewlett Packard, Intel, all got together and said, we've got this space of small technology that nobody's playing in, um, and we, but we don't have the expertise to do it. We're not world class, but if we put all four of the universities together, and we add the federal lab in, plus all the industry that's in, in the, primarily in the, the Portland area, the region, but statewide, we've got a silicon forest, a high-tech industry cluster, about 250 researchers in five institutions. So that's building the expertise across institutions, reaching out, building partnerships. And then we can, then they, this organization was formed with the help of state money, local money, and certainly private dollars, university dollars. We'll talk about some of that. But then it invests, this whole organization is about, first of all, finding the research expertise, help the, figuring out how to collaborate so that we have a, a signature research effort. Um, and then investing in programs in all the areas that we talked about, uh, networking, entrepreneurs, investing in shared facilities. Uh, in the small technology space, the, 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 uh, the tools, the, the, the uh, telescopes, everything that's required is incredibly expensive and no small and medium-sized business really can afford a lot of them themselves. So investing in that technology so that, that the industry has, the small companies have access to it. And then they have created a high-tech extension service where they 20, 200 companies of all sizes on a fee-for-service basis. And this is coordinated by one individual. His name is Skip Rung. He came from Hewlett Packard, and you need to meet Skip Rung. And all the people I'm going to talk to you about today have very similar characteristics. It's all about, and then let me be really clear, this organization does no research. It was not created to do research. It was created to find the expertise across all of the universities in, in Oregon, think region here, make it visible, make it known. When somebody needs to figure out how to get it, you go see Skip Wrong, and now he's got others. Uh, and then thinking about that and how do we build an expertise, how do we signal to the world that uh, we are here to help companies, uh, both large and small companies, uh, compete both in innovation and commercialize those new innovation and create companies. Skip then spends a lot of his time on uh, figuring out gap financing. Uh, he spends a lot of his time on helping his companies um, go through entrepreneurial boot camps and, I mean, the researchers go through entrepreneurial boot camps. He has all the same things you have, but it's all coordinated in a very strategic way with all the industry designing what those programs look like. So <clears throat> this looks a little bit like what um, I would say GE told what the states they could do. So you won't read this into it, but I'm going to tell you what he says here. What I read into his comments is more and more industry, large and small, are looking for um, tailored research, tailored talent, and a supply chain help with the supply chain, help us be competitive as a supply chain. So working with all the suppliers in a collaborative way. And you get this from, so the statement here about, you're looking for the community college that has a, that, that has a plan for partnering with the industry to get workers. They're looking for universities that signal their strengths by uh, indicating where the investments are and by collaborating across multiple institutions so that a CEO, a small and medium-sized business, knows where your strengths are, what expertise you have. And then finally, promoting, that's the supply chain. Promote the big company and small, medium, and size connection for training and supply chain development. Um, Jeff Emelt basically said, a big companies don't really need the help. We need the help with the research. I'm not telling you that. But it's really help, help us with the small and medium-sized companies that are part of our supply chain. Help us uh, help them improve their innovation capacity, their quality capacity, uh, and their global capacity, uh, and their talent that they need. Because they don't really have time to be thinking about that strategically. Next example. 
and I'm way over. So this one I point out because this is the Virginia Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Zone. The reason I point this out is because this is one of the models that the federal administration has, uh, the federal, President Obama's and others have been looking at as the model for the, it's called the National Network of Manufacturing Institutes. They're putting out awards, they're putting out um, grant opportunities right now. They've awarded four. They're looking for more. They have a goal of 45 of these around the country. I don't think Congress will give them that kind of money, but it's really clear the whole administration has gobbled, uh, uh, put together all the money across DOE, uh, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, Defense, to figure out how to make these institutes do exactly what we're going to talk about here. Where you're focused on an industry cluster, an industry sometimes across industry, which we'll point out, and it's all about tailoring research with them helping shape the agenda, with them shaping the agenda, tailoring the talent they need, the whole talent pipeline, and working, bringing the small and medium-sized uh, business to the table to help uh, benefit from that interaction and that partnership. So that's what it looks like physically, uh, but here's the big issue about how do you get money so Center for Advanced Manufacturing, here's his purpose. You can see on the side, foster collaboration among diverse industry sectors. What's really important here is basically Rolls-Royce came to Virginia, said, you want me? This is what I need. I need tailored research, and I want all of your universities. I don't want one. I want this. I need a whole... Uh, a whole partnership and I will and I need other companies to be part of that partnership and we're willing to put money on the table so they have these companies not all of them are in the same industry but they have common themes on research common interest on research and talent uh, the big companies put four hundred dollars four hundred thousand dollars on the table every year the CEOs are at the table they design the research some of the research is generic for everybody. Some of it can be uh, 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 intellectual property goes to the company. Um, and then they're working on the talent pipeline. Now you can see the universities. All three universities have to be there. They commit resources. The faculty's on site. Uh, and students are on site working with the, with the, the, um, the industry. And the important thing is um, the uh, companies have to bring in uh, a new partner every year. And now they're adding the second tier supply chain because they want the supply chain in the loop. And the supply chain, small and medium sized companies don't have to pay the same kind of fee. It is the model that we show all states, all communities. I know Greater Phoenix is looking at this right now. Tucson's looking at this right now. But it doesn't just have to be about this industry. You saw it with nanotechnology. And you're, now you're going to see it with wine. So here's an example of, from Walla, for Walla Walla. So if you know, you can see. It, uh, um, Washington had a program of 15 innovation zones decided like all of us we want to create innovation zones so every place was to come up with a, could come up for, with a, a strategy compete for dollars and at the base of that was a research organization something thinking about the innovation the research expertise uh, Walla Walla um, they went in for wine and hospitality water management and alternative energy they started with wine and hospitality they were so successful and I'm going to show you uh, and they, they've moved into water management and alternative energy. This is led by a community college. So here's national stories and um, um, 60 Minutes did a story on this. Uh, we bring uh, Steve Van Heusen, who's the president of community college, often to our meetings, introduce him to governors. Um, so here's, here's what he, they decided. So Walla Walla, small community, a terrible problem of out migration. Couldn't get any of the young people to stay. Losing population. Um, decided that uh, they they could figure out. They applied to be one of the innovation zones. They got a strategy together, and they decided to take the agricultural agricultural strengths 
and turn it into wine. You know that story here, at least in California, but you certainly know this also with your agriculture. Um, I think I've told you that I used to, sh I t said earlier in a meeting, I always use the prepackaged salad mix from Salinas Valley, California, as my example of what innovation is all about. You take the existing ingredients, combine it in a new way, add a little technology, and you add value. And I pay a high price for that packaged salad mix. So here they decided to add value like the cod. Remember the cod story? So they're going to add value. It's a high value industry. We're going to focus on high value industry and very important last bullet. Tourism with, from the wine industry is a lot more lucrative than normal tourism. So did their homework, figured out where the high value added was, ended up with uh, not only wine, but so the community colleges, I'll show you the examples, not only the wine, but you have wine, food, and art, making it a very good package across and, and complementary industries. Here's their vision. I'm so totally out of time, so I can't go through all this. But you can see a very important strategy in all the partners who had to be around the table. And so here's what we have. Building expertise. Center of Innovation for the Wine Industry. This is a community college, remember. Um, learning for the students, learning how to make wine uh, as well as going to classes. So hands-on learning opportunity. So moved forward, now we've decided we can be the laboratories for all of the wine industry globally. Shared facilities, back again, remember? So we got expertise, we got talent, we got shared facilities. Uh, and now we're into wine incubators. These are the little incubators for uh, the students to start their wineries. So we got inc entrepreneurship, incubators. And then, whoa, we got wine export draws buyers from around the world to Walla Walla. We got global. Uh, so, and uh, we've got all the components. If you think back to the framework about uh, how, what are the six factors that matter for growth, they got them all. They worked on all of them. They got entrepreneurs, they got innovation, they've got talent, they've got capital, uh, they've got clusters, and they're worrying about the global interaction. I think that's a pretty amazing story. And the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Uh, so they've pretty much calculated not only their cluster, but what the population would look like with employment growth would look like without the, the wine cluster and with the wine cluster. So successful. They got another one. Now they're working on the Center for Innovation for Water and Environment. They're working on the southeast, the energy cluster. And so you can see success breeds success. So, so I probably need to stop, but um, <laughs> so I have a few more case studies, but I think I better stop because I'm way over and I think we all have a reception. So um, I, I think it's best I close. So see me afterwards if you want to hear my other two stories. I have one from South Carolina and I have one from California. So, and I have one from Phoenix, Arizona. So anyway, see me if you want to hear those stories while we're at the cocktail hour. So sorry. I'm going to be so late. Sorry. Thank you, Mary Jo, for a wonderful <laughs> presentation. It, it, was, uh, it was a little bit like, I think you'll agree with me, it was like drinking uh, water out of a I fire know, hose. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was wonderful. We will pour over your slides. Will you allow us to post it on our website? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, yes. So people can refer back to, to things that you did. Um, I actually had um, three canned questions here that they pre my staff prepared for me, but I think I'm going to ask you three other questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then we'll open it up to, to the audience. Um, the first one is, um, you know, some of the, I, I should preface this with this statement. Um, I know that some of your uh, very strong statements about uh, fitting jobs to, um, you know, fitting degrees to jobs uh, is going to raise some hackles. Um, in our community. So uh, I do want to um, make the point uh, that this session is about economic development. And so we're looking to see how what we do here can support economic development. That doesn't exhaust the range of, um, of activities, of programs, and of value that we provide to our students. 
Uh, there is that other major mission of universities, which is to prepare citizens for a vibrant democracy uh, and to reach a, a, a rich, uh, uh, rewarding life, to, to lead a rich, rewarding life. And so those are other aspects of, of our institution that uh, just because we haven't focused on them today doesn't mean that they're not very important. Um, I also, but even within the, the range of, uh, within the, the focus on economic development, um, in the idea of aligning what, how we prepare students better with uh, jobs and careers that are out there, uh, do you think that, uh, I was a little concerned about that uh, diagram that uh, showed what, uh, how Harvard was projecting, you know, occupations and, and uh, lifetime value and so forth. Uh, it's, it's nice that they distinguish between the lifetime value for businesses versus the lifetime value for individuals and how you know, the best is a win-win quadrant there right. at the upper right hand. Exactly. But even so, uh, doesn't that still presuppose that there's a one-to-one -one match between majors and careers? And is that really, uh, I mean, w should that be the goal or should it be uh, focusing on uh, competencies that students could have that can then a little bit of a loaded question, sure. but you know, sure. uh, that could make them more more flexible and allow them to change occupations over their lifetime. Um, and uh, and so, would would tailoring degree, degrees and programs so tightly to current job titles uh, would that give them rather short shelf life? Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree more. So I think the whole the America Works that uh, NGA is working on is definitely focusing on, um, it's not just about the degree, degree, thinking about other kinds of uh, training, certificates, thinking about stacking credentials, all the things that's in the, the field out there. There's no question that uh, the right policy way to go, definitely a lot of conversation around that. I think the challenge from this perspective is, is really the issue of uh, states, governors, others who work on economic development see, you know, some high growth, high demand, um, and high paying jobs not being filled, and they're puzzled by what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So the natural reaction is, I got policy levers, what do I have to work with? So from an uh, elected official, I've got these levers, I can do this. And so there's that, there's that, certainly that kind of notion. But I think everybody would say that, and my argument is usually, it's not about everything, it's about you basically have to say, these are important to our industry here, and we are going to incentivize or put some money on the table if you're willing to help meet those needs. But that's not taking away from the full understanding of what the role of education in the university is. So I, and it's the same for research. I don't, I don't tell governors that every researcher should be thinking about commercializing or being an entrepreneur. The most important thing you can say is this is important. I'm willing to put a pot of money on the table, and if you want to help meet that need, you get money to help meet that need. But if you still want to focus here and do some of that, that's great too. You know, you need to think about that. So I, I think that's, that's very important. I think the whole field, believe me, I'm not the education policy person, but we do a lot with education. Um, and I can tell you, as you all know, the, the world is changing faster than we can keep up. So I think uh, we're all aware that it's got to, we've got to figure out a way to, to measure your competent, how you, what you're prepared for, not by just your degree, but what your skills are. And I think we had a conversation earlier that um, more and more, um, I think most people are thinking that those degrees need to be thinking much more about problem solving skills and other things and not just some of the things that we've traditionally thought of as what that degree says you know how to do. Mm -hmm. That degree should say you know how to do this and that's need to be what's happening in the classroom so that you know how to do this and we have a very good signal. I mean that's the issue. You tell me you, you got a degree from X from somewhere. I don't know. Ex industry's telling us. I'm not sure I know what that means because they come in my door and it doesn't quite fit with what I thought they would be able to know and do. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of, you know, communication. So our whole issue about the chairs initiative is 
we have to get everybody at the table. It's got to be the economic development community, the workforce community, the education community, and industry at the table to start talking about these things and figuring out how to align it. Thanks. So definitely. So let, me, let me give an opportunity for our audience to uh, ask a, a couple of questions before we, we break up. And we do have a, a reception for Mary Jo Waits at the University Center next door right after we conclude here. Um, can't quite see who's... I know, it's hard We have microphones here. Okay, so, yes. In, 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 except in the, in the case study that you presented uh, about Walla Walla, uh, regarding considerations of sustainability and environmental management. Now, I'm of the belief that business and sustainability and, and environmental management go hand in hand, that those considerations are strong. And I see it, for example, in President Crow's approach at ASU and the uh, establishment of the College of Sustainability. Sure. Now, I wonder... Uh, where in the conversation this fits. I have tremendous respect for Jeffrey Immelt, by the way, and what he has done in, uh, regarding GE's approach to business. And in that, where in that conversation at the National Governors Association does the consideration, one, of environmental and sustainability uh, 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 considerations come in, and two, shared value with communities. Uh, since uh, Michael Porter invented the term, it seems to me that his involvement ought to bring to it um, uh, benefit to the communities in which uh, uh, these, these organizations, uh, these business entities, uh, would bring. Well, so my examples um, were chosen because of uh, sort of outside folks have sort of said they do this well. It wasn't about the industry, <laughs> and I was sort of preference that in my remarks, that um, they might not fit totally with your, your particular clusters or industry here, but there are some common characteristics to those, uh, whether it's Onami or Walla Walla, they're, they're working on some common things. So there are plenty of an examples, just as you said, the Center for Sustainability at ASU, one of my examples in there that I didn't talk about was the Colorado Clean Energy Collaboratory. Fantastic model. It basically, uh, Colorado said, we're going to be leading in clean energy. And just like Onami said, but we're not going to do it with one university. Our strength is going to come by collaborating across all the universities plus a federal lab. And that collaboratory is all about coordinating that research agenda not as strongly as Onami and others in terms of the workforce element of it. But there, there are all kinds of examples of where communities have decided sustainability was their uh, area of expertise, and they've built these same kinds of organizations and same kinds of agendas around it. So by me picking those, it was really a statement of who I see as putting all the best pieces together. Yes. Uh, Mary Jo Waits, I want to thank you for delivering an incredibly interesting and, and idea-filled presentation. Uh, I made the mistake of arriving late, and uh, if you arrive late, you miss a lot. <laughs> but what I did get was a lot of interesting observations on something that's very locally involving, which is wine production and wine grape production. Monterey County has, produces the largest volume of grapes of any county mm -hmm. in California. It is numero uno. However, the value added part goes to Napa, Sonoma, uh, those areas who import and the Monterey County grape production to blend in with other grapes in order to produce some incredibly, uh, you know, the, the non-two-buck chuck type wines <laughs> and all. And 
Uh, this, has, this has been very interesting because um, wine consumption has astounded everyone. Um, you know, prices have never been higher. Volumes have never been greater. People are wondering who on earth is consuming all this wine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on here? But uh, nevertheless, in <clears throat> uh, California as a whole, uh, we export more uh, STEM graduates than we employ here. They 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 learn here. They go to other places. And we also have the curse of something called Prop 13, mm -hmm. which does a magnificent job of driving out industry to our neighbors, neighboring fir uh, places and so forth. Um, what I'm getting around to is there are many factors here other than just the university. <laughs> my, my question is, um, I think... I think you're um, I think you're neglecting some of the barriers that have been created by um, various things like California's notorious uh, regulatory climate, its incredibly lack of friendliness to uh, we're, we're number two from the we're we're two up from the bottom uh, from New York, which is the worst place in the world <laughs> to start a business and so forth. Um, I, I think I think you've done a good job on the 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 role of the university and how it can be very useful, but uh, there are many other factors here that that uh, that are involved, and I think you might uh, give them some consideration. Sure. Well, so my requested topic was the role of the university. <laughs> Not the role of all state uh, gover or governments in this sense. So there's no question that, um, you know, regulatory and tax environment is a uh, certainly a foundational element, as is transportation, which... Um, all three of those I don't tend to talk about primarily because I can tell you most policy advisors, policy people I know, know about those really well because they hear about them a lot. And so what they don't know are the things I talk about, frankly. And so that's why I focus on sort of the talent. They do know that, but how I can add value to what they know is really much more about the area that I'm talking about. But there's no question that, you know, if, you, if you've got difficult. And then the second thing I will say is Jim Collins taught us this from the good to great. He basically said, you could say all day, I, if this was only different, I could do X. And most companies that are gone good to great didn't say, well, if, the, if I didn't have to compete in the global marketplace, I, wouldn't, I could do this. It's really about this is what I got, so I've got to work with it, and I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I need to do and not just say I wish the, thing, the world would change because I've got to work, I've got to survive, and I've got to compete. So I think that's part of it, but I think if you can control local regulatory issues, you should. I mean, the, I mean, the, many of those issues. Uh, now, having said that, I'm talking about time for permitting and those kinds of things uh, are really important or you can't get access to, uh, you know, the university to talk about how do I, you know, training program or something like that. You can fix those for sure. The other thing I'll say is I, I'm just totally talking off of just the cuff. I heard a conversation, but I thought it was very intriguing. Some of the advanced manufacturers in California are making an argument in the, the process I told, we talked about, the, the California summit process where the regions are bubbling up their strategies that's being put on by foundations and the business leadership where the state kind of bubbles up a strategy by what the regions are. In those conversations with advanced manufacturers, uh, I've heard a number of the large companies saying, we might be able to call that a strength and that we figured out how to, to uh, survive and compete here in, 
at the uh, uh, meeting the regulations in California, and we can consider that sort of a um, a competency that we wouldn't have thought of. So how do we turn that into an opportunity rather than just thinking about it as a strategy? Now that's totally. I just heard it in one short conversation, but I thought it was a novel idea. <laughs> so so might be something that's valuable. And then most industry will tell you uh, meeting standards. Reasonable standards are really help them in terms of what they're doing in order to be competitive if they can do that. So, questions? One more question? Two? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Well, productivity in the classic sense is sort of uh, what what it, what is the the value you get for the input? So for the amount of inputs going in, either talent, technology, capital, what is the value of your output? So thinking of it that way, it could be measured for a state. Uh, state gross products, certainly companies obviously have their own measures. In the university side, it's sort of like uh, given what's going in, what is the return on investment coming out? What are we getting in terms of the amount in for the amount coming out is sort of the thinking of that. There are, the metrics are, are different from all places. It's the concept of uh, if you're not worrying about adding value, uh, and increasing value, um, you're probably not thinking about the right things in terms of industry. As Michael Porter said, if you have, an, if you have a company who hasn't changed anything in the last five years, they're probably not focusing on their productivity or doing very well. Yeah. well yeah, on the policy side, um, uh, Dan, I think that uh, yeah, your, your point is, is, is the measure of output uh, uh, Full enough right. measure does it capture all of the Correct. all of the goods and and clearly uh, you know what what may seem like to a business like an onerous regulation may in fact from a, st a policy standpoint be a way of ex internalizing right. what are negative externalities right. of their activity and uh, the only problem is when you do that uh, 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 locally whereas while well, the company has to compete globally and then that creates right. a problem Correct. that's a challenge for policy yeah. but it's definitely a real issue and. And we do need to, I mean, ideally, uh, the, the kind of a sophisticated regulatory environment that was not unduly punitive uh, should be able to capture those right. negative externalities. And so if businesses are able to thrive in an environment like that in California, let's assume for a minute that all of our California regulations are wise and enlightened. Uh, <laughs> if, if that were the case, you know, then we could really be pointing the future to a better, you know, a better uh, standard of living for the whole world if our companies can thrive in that right. environment. That was kind of the statement. You articulated it much better than I heard it. It was sort of like, well, we could, we could argue that that's a strength yeah. that we have as companies here in California. Great. Was there one, one more Just question? one last question over here. Thank you. I can't see. Okay. Switching gears back to the um, image that you showed us where there was the hub for the innovation centers and everyone putting inputting into this central um, organization of some kind. Oh, yeah. I've thought a lot about that and over time. And I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on what it is that um, you found in those case studies that were the, the incentives and, and or the punishments for not coming to the table and um, getting past those individual silos that sometimes are very difficult to break down and get everyone to really participate in those uh, collaboratively in that through that central organization. What is it that were the criteria in those case studies you thought were so successful? Well, uh, for those kinds of organizations, um, uh, 
there are certain components that are kind of s created or set there. I mean, a group has already gotten together and said, um, it's, this is important, we need to do it, and this is what, we're, what, what our vision is and what we're working towards, and we're putting resources on the table for that. <clears throat> the rest of it is really, it's really about the networking and connecting. I mean, it's really this talent of, oh, you're important to the competitiveness of my companies. I've got to figure out how to bring you in and connect you so that you see value. So it's, it's not easy. It's, it's hard work, <laughs> I can assure you, from what I've seen. Uh, and most of, the, most of it, so the other one I didn't put up there, and I highly, they're just down the street, so to speak, up the street in uh, San Francisco is the Regis Kelly, who runs the Quantitative Biosciences uh, Institute, which is one of California's four science and innovation institutes. Uh, multiple universities, um, and Regis was, uh, um, had never done anything like this. He was an academic uh, researcher, world class in his own right. His, his chancellor, I get presidents and chancellors mixed up, so sorry, <laughs> of the University of California at San Francisco. Chancellor. Chancellor said, <laughs> Regis, you need to go create this thing. And you're going to have to bring all the academics and have them think about relocating in South, by the way, a big effort, if you'd seen the pictures, a revitalization of, the, of a very distressed community. Uh, but, but what did he do? He said, I had no job description. I just figured my job is to connect everybody who needs to know everybody. And then my other job is, if I've got a gap in this ecosystem, my job is to orchestrate so that we solve that gap. It sounds easy and it's not all done, but I have to tell you, that's what they work on. That's what their agenda is. And it can be from, Regis goes around and talks to industry to say, how come you're not here? Why aren't you here? What's wrong? And he'll say, well, I can't stand the work with the university because they don't do X, Y, and Z. So his job is to fix that. Or his job is to connect entrepreneurs to the expertise. Or his job is to connect students with companies. Uh, you know, on and on. And then find, uh, find dollars. And he has very little money. He was given $5 million to start with, and then he raises all of his own money. Same for Skip Rung. Same for, uh, you know, Walla Walla certainly got money from uh, applying for the, the state program. But this, that's pretty much on there, reorganize their own priorities. So the point, what makes it work? Success. You know, if, uh, anywhere you go, once you have some successes and you see successes, then everybody wants to be part of your network. Uh, is really the bottom line. You, there's, and frankly, the other examples into the question of sustainability, the Onami was the first pilot in Oregon. Right now, the second pilot is called iBest, and it's all about um, uh, clean energy. So working on uh, what are all the industry around the same kind of collaboration that I showed for the, the small technology in, in Oregon. But what works is, it, you know, it's, everybody wants to be part of a successful uh, initiative, and they get value out of it, um, and they see that by leveraging their dollars and their resources and their time, it pays off to them much more than if they had done it by themselves. So it's not, it's not, there's no magic <laughs> potion. It's a lot of hard work. And frankly, it's also a lot about personality. But Regis and Skip are different personalities. Uh, Steve Van Heusen, different personality. So even though it is about personality, there's, there, uh, there are differences in personalities. But it's that ability to connect and listen and, and figure out who needs to meet who. Well, thank you very much, Mary no, Jo. Wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you all for coming. And once again, uh, you're all invited to join us for a reception with Mary Jo Waits at the University Center next door at the World Theater. Thank you. So sorry about the link.